Hello. So in this problem, we're going to look at a uranium atom. So uranium is um, radioactive, so it decomposes into other particles. So this uranium atom is deep in the earth and you know it has like all these neutrons and protons and it's going to split. That's what uranium does. And it's called this the alpha particle. And so the alpha particle is, yeah, the fragment of an atom. So this uh, particular alpha particle has a uh, initial speed V, right? Uh, it travels a distance D before stopping in the earth. You have to find the force from the dirt that stopped the particle. In terms of the velocity, the distance, and the mass of this particle. Don't plug in any numbers yet, okay? And assume that the force was constant. Okay, so you have your alpha particle here, you know, it divided. And it's going to be, colliding, you know, with rock and whatever you're having there, uh, molten iron, you know, in any case, there's going to be some dirt, because it's a decent name, that is going to stop uh, the alpha particle, right? So the, we know that from the kinematic equation that the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus twice the acceleration times the displacement. So here the displacement, we're gonna call it D. The final velocity is zero because it stopped the initial velocity, we're just calling it V. And we want to know the force. So remember that force equals mass times acceleration. And we have the acceleration over there. So this implies that the acceleration is force divided by mass. So we can just put it in here. It's going to be force. And we divide the whole thing by mass. And we want to know the force. So we just have to solve this equation for, for F, for the force. So minus V squared divided by, well, times the mass, divided by twice the distance. And that is equal to the force. Cool. So the negative direction, negative in there, means that the force is in the direction opposite to the velocity. So if it's moving in this direction, the force is in the opposite direction. If it's moving in this direction, then the force is in the opposite direction. So it depends, it's gonna depend on the, on, on the particular direction in which it is moving. But that's what the negative means over there. And yeah, this is actually very general. This holds for, you know, any, not just any alpha particle, but any particle that uh, finds itself in the same situation. So for, this is part A. For part B, we have to show that this has the right units. So meter squared is gonna be, I mean, velocity squared is meter per second squared, the mass is in kilograms, and the distance is in meters. So I can make this 
-hmm. Look like this. So we have the meters squared, second squared, kilograms, meters, and nothing. And we're dividing this whole thing by this whole thing. So this is going to be meter square kilogram. And then this one and this one is meter uh, second squared. This meter goes away with this one. And so we have kilogram meter per second squared. And this is an acceleration. This is a mass. So mass times acceleration, that's a force. So the units are correct. And this unit, we call it a Newton. For part C, discuss how your answer to part A, so this one, depends on all three variables and show that it makes sense. Okay, so if the distance is really, actually, let me, we can look at this in a better way. If the distance is very long, then this force is going to be small. Which makes sense. If the force is small, you can travel without uh, stopping for a very long time. For example, when we move uh, through the atmosphere, you know, just uh, the air resistance, if you're not moving very fast, the air resistance is pretty tiny. And so it will be a very long distance before, you know, air resistance will uh, stop something. Um, if the distance is short, then F is large. Right, small, large. And this makes sense. For example, when you crash against the wall, this distance is very tiny. And so the force is pretty humongous, so humongous that it might hurt you. So it makes sense. So that would be the distance. For the, the mass, If the mass is large, then the force, all things being equal, the force is large. And that's because if you have a larger mass, then the inertia is larger and you need a bigger force to stop it. You know, imagine when someone throws, I don't know, a, you know, rubber ball. Uh, that's actually kind of painful. Um, yeah, you know, like if you throw a rock that is uh, pretty massive, then uh, the force that you feel stopping it is pretty large. Uh, let's say let's say that instead uh, it's you know, a piece of cloth or like, you know, one of those, like a, I don't know, a dog toy that is very light. So then you can stop it very easily. You almost don't feel it because the force is very tiny. Even if you're throwing the pet toy and the rock at the same speed. So this makes sense. The opposite, the inverse also makes sense. So if mass is uh, small, then the force is small. And again, uh, it's because of the inertia. And the velocity squared, let's say that you're throwing the same thing, you know, it's a, a rock. If you throw it slowly,
then the force is going to be pretty tiny. But if you throw it really hard, then the force is going to be really hard. What is interesting about this is that it's squared. And that might be a little bit more difficult to, to feel in an intuitive way. Um, we're going to see it in a more mathematical way later, but it doesn't go just, you know, it doesn't increase linearly with the velocity. Um, it increases quadratically. We'll see how this comes from the fact that the kinetic energy is quadratic and is related to work. But, you know, for now, it's okay. Um, you just have to realize that force increases with increasing mass increases with increasing velocity and decreases with, um, with increasing distance. All right, so that was part C. And for part D, evaluate your results for, and then we're given some numbers finally. All right, so. The mass of this particular particle is uh, 6.7 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The velocity is um, Two point zero times ten to the four kilometers per second, and you know that I like to use SI units right away. So I'm just going. This is kilometers, so it's thousands. So we could just put a seven over here and use meters instead of kilometers. Makes things easier. And then the distance is zero point seventy one millimeters and let's do the same thing. One millimeter is one times 10 to the negative three, one thousandth of a meter. Right, so what is the force? Well, we have our equation over here. Force is gonna be minus uh, two times 10 to the seven meters per second squared. The mass is 6.7 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And this is twice. The distance is, this is actually nicer. We can just move this point over here. This will be negative four. And this will be 7.1. meters, so all of our units are consistent. So the part above is gonna be the numerator. It's gonna be four times 10 to the 14th, and this one multiplied by 6.7 times 10 to the negative 27. This is uh, 2.7 times 10 to the negative 12 um, kilogram times meter per second. And this is gonna be mm, didn't give me scientific notation, but it's one point. It's gonna be 14. 0.2 times 10 to the negative three meters. We can move this one over here. So it'll be uh, negative two. Let's get rid of that um, due to significant figures. And that's pretty good. So we multiplied one, and we divide this one by this one. And we get, 
Um, oh, this is negative, don't forget about that. Negative 1.88, so let's say 1.9 times 10 to the negative nine. And we had seen before that this whole thing is gonna be in newtons. So this is gonna be in 1.9 nanonewtons. which is reasonable. This is a very, very, very tiny force. But this is a very, 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 very tiny mass. So uh, it's pretty, it's actually pretty reasonable for, uh, for a force in, in nuclear physics. All right, so awesome. I hope that you enjoyed this problem. It's, it was pretty cool.